Thank you, Kathy. Uh, thanks to you all for coming. I'm the caboose on this train. We have a session next uh, that will uh, round out a great meeting. Uh, it's been great so far. In particular, the discussions about the roles of proteins in neurodegeneration and the, the ECM, extracellular matrix of the aging heart. I want to give you small doses of oncology and immunology. And um, as I take up my favorite topic, which is mapping human cells and the proteins within them, and, you know, we've seen it throughout the meeting. You all know the story. You can map in different ways, right? You can map in chemical space, compositional space, uh, actual space, <laughs> and through time. And in proteomics, that's the central theme of my talk today, is how can we do this and get uh, the sweet spot right there for proteomics and get all of those things to actually happen? And it's... Um, uh, that complementarity that I wish to focus on today. And prescient as always, the Allen Brain Atlas, uh, years ago, now Brain Institute, um, space, spatial mapping is on the lips of everyone, right? That's the normal way in which you think about mapping complex systems. In proteomics, the HPA here took 17,000 antibodies and did a similar sort of thing with a nine-figure investment, stood up, in, stood up in Stockholm some uh, decade or so ago, and um, that's the largest centralized effort, uh, at least as far as spatial mapping, and mainly tissues and some uh, cell types. But of course, the massive investment from the Human Cell Atlas uh, Consortium, working closely with NIH Common Fund initiatives and a lot of other initiatives, NCI, for the spatial mapping piece, right? So that's happening um, and, and moving quickly. And we've seen it here today as well, using a mature technology. Right, getting 3,000 uh, uh, 3, uh, sequence uh, gene expression reads from individual cells spatially resolved is happening, right? And it's going to be happening on a billion cells soon. Uh, you know, the Human Cell Atlas Consortium just released their white paper last week. Proteomics, the technology is still maturing. So that's what I want to talk about, and that's where my brain is a lot of the time. And it's, uh, you know, uh, uh, near and dear to my heart. And uh, the, the uh, mature technologies here, you know, I, I just want to focus also on the compositional aspects, the precise mapping of protein composition. And even that fundamental uh, is in need of further attention. And I'll explain more of that um, presently. So there is a version 1.0 map of the human proteome. In 2014, there were these back-to-back -back papers in Nature. Uh, and, but by virtue of the technologies used, in mass spectrometry-based proteomics, the bottom-up proteomics, trips and digestion of complex mixtures of proteins, uh, there's knowledge gaps. And the peptides, which is the, the unit of currency in bottom-up proteomics, uh, are surrogates for the whole proteins. They're not the whole proteins. That's part of the knowledge gap. There's protein variability not captured. They have limited correlation with phenotypes, some, but limited. So let's fill that knowledge gap and map precisely the whole proteins directly and I'll say within cells of a certain type. So that's the world of proteiforms. And we heard it today, uh, or yesterday, excuse me. And so what is a proteiform? Um, it has a precise definition, at least as of 2013, courtesy of the Consortium for Top-Down Proteomics. So when you switch alternative splice variants, that affects the base sequences substantially. And then you multiply that, it's the matrix, with all the site-specific features. And the combinations of those events uh, create a proteiform, so a SNP, the right splice variant, uh, isoform, and with combinations of modifications. So that's a proteiform. And importantly, in top-down proteomics, or use of the whole proteiform as the unit of currency that we, that we use, uh, it always maps back to a single gene. This is getting picked up in the field uh, nicely in the past few years. And so you can think about what the next generation of proteomics might be. What's proteomics 2.0, the next major telescope uh, if you to use an astronomy analogy. Um, and in 2012, uh, you know, focusing on cells as the, as in the hierarchical organization of biological systems like us, um, a single cell type and the proteiforms within it, within it would define the cellular proteome. So I tried to frame a project back in 2012. And uh, throughout a number of 4,000 cell types, I actually justified in this paper as well as the 250,000 proteiform estimate. So in each cell type, uh, if you were to determine the composition of 250,000 proteiforms, 
that would be a billion proteiforms across the human body. And you could throw in some fluids, uh, uh, human fluids into that as well. And so that would be the frame of a cell-based human proteome project. And in the intervening five years, there's been a growing number of labs, still in minority in the field, but, but trying to assert and assign the functions of these proteiforms. Map them, assign the functions, prove that they have value. And on, there's some of that laced throughout my talk, as you'll see. So uh, the next big telescope to map pro uh, the proteiform universe, uh, Proteomics 2.0, could use proteiforms as the unit of currency. And so I've been describing these kind of things for some time. Let me try uh, to just show you rather than tell you in the general case. So I'm just going to show you in, the, in, the, uh, in a key oncogene, get a KRAS, and correlate the proteiforms that are mapped with genotypes and phenotypes in cells and tumors. And do that in just a short vignette by way of uh, closing the introductory part of the talk. So most everyone here knows about oncogenic KRAS. Uh, here I'll be focusing on the G13D mutation, which locks it in the GTP uh, bound form, the on that, that um, stimulates effector pathways, downstream signaling goes crazy, and uh, you get proliferation. So driving cancer mutation, uh, truly the case. Now this gene family is the perfect um, uh, exemplar to describe the, the, how things uh, change when you look at the whole protein. So here we have three human genes, H, N, and KRAS. Uh, they are highly identical in this blue region. Uh, the sequences are almost all identical. So when you digest those to get little peptides, you blur the isoforms uh, together, and much less the alternative splice variants. Uh, so exon 4 is alternatively spliced in 4A and 4B, and much less modifications, right? So we want to be precise about these things because they do clearly matter. And when you get to modifications, there's this interesting discussion in the field about, well, you get a lot of post-translational modifications have been mapped, a lot of sources of variation, and people explode these large numbers of possible proteiforms. Key word there is possible. So I'll just show you very quickly that uh, cysteine-118 and the C-terminus is where the action is, which mods are important, which mods are functional. Uh, whole protein mass spectrometry, this drops out of doing that process. In this system, how many proteiforms exist out of the possible? The answer is four. And here's two of them. Uh, if I'm just growing cancer cells in a dish, they're doubling every 24 hours. I have a 57 Dalton difference because I've got the whole protein, and I've switched a G to a D. That's a 57 Dalton shift. That's the raw data. Um, there's just two proteiforms, and you get the full composition of these proteins. And uh, so it's N-terminally acetylated completely. It's all farnesylated, and it's C-terminally methylated, so signaling is good to go. Um, uh, in the cell line. And then moving to uh, the, uh, if you knock out the wild type allele, just leaving the oncogenic one, the cells double the same. They don't change much phenotype. Simple thing, you just drop the red proteiform out and just leaving the uh, oncogenic or oncoproteiform behind. And uh, uh, the real interesting thing happens here. If you knock out the G13D allele, uh, Hopefully the red you, or the green, you can see one of the two will work. Uh, G13D, the cells uh, get 2x slower. They become smaller. They become much more adherent. Uh, and their, uh, their proteiforms completely shift. So the, now the dominant proteiform isn't the normal wild type allele. It's shifted 29 Daltons. And it's got a, a cysteine nitrosylation on it. And you know, mapping this kind of thing precisely, and it's, and it's basically 100% stoichiometry. It's just, it's just staring you in the face. And um, to map these things precisely and in combination, or to link the part, the language of genetics and genomics with uh, post-translational modifications, you really have to analyze the whole protein. Now, when you go and try to translate this into primary tumors, lots of different cell types, of course, these data are from where you have 80% cancerous cells in these samples. And uh, the action, where's the action? Where's the post-translational modifications? Well, we map our friend the wild-type proteiform that we've seen before. And the oncoproteiform, even though this is a heterozygous and a homozygous patient, uh, the het here, you only have 10% dosage of the oncoproteiform. So you can actually determine how much uh, penetrance the genotype has all the way to the protein level. Um, but here, the action's on the methylation. We're seeing highly variable methylation in the first four patients we've done this on. 
And so there's, there's what you get out of, out of compositional analysis. That methylation, it, there's just some very recent data from the RAS initiative that shows there's important biology and there's a lack of signaling if you don't have that methylation. So uh, that's a quick vignette. And now, um, you know, to do, you'd like to know the, the, the composition, but also spatially resolved, right? That's the critical element. And that's what we've been working on. That's the thing that's been enabled by this ADI award. Um, uh, we've been combining uh, flow cytometry with top-down proteomics and uh, doing uh, this in immune cells for the last couple of years. And uh, we can now, for example, in B cells, look at memory versus naive B cells. And I'll give you the cell counts in a moment. But you can actually now create a quantitative comparison, at least for proteomes, 30 kilo, proteiforms, 30 kilodaltons and lower. You can actually, each of these uh, circles is a proteiform. And uh, you get the you know, log quantitative information. And uh, you can actually do this experiment now uh, on a couple thousand proteiforms, even from 400,000 cells. So there's uh, been a large uh, improvement in processes from 10 million cell cells down to 400,000 cells, 25x improvement. Uh, we have two, evaluated two other types of uh, proteomics, or mass spectrometry-based mapping. And so in histone modifications, there's a, a histone panel we have that, that monitors quantitatively 80 histone marks on all the core histones. And we've dropped that considerably now. Now we're approaching the 1,000 cell mark and with technical replicates for that. Cell surface protein capture still needs some work, I think, to get down to where they can be relevant, you know, even down to the million cell level. And, and we delineated that in a recent publication. So let's look at the proteiform resolved information that we've accrued. Uh, so for example, in different cell lineages, CD19 B cell gating versus uh, CD3 plus T cells, here's a, a known proteiform. So the, the defense in one here, uh, this is a known proteiform, but we can quantify it now. I just give you one technical replicate from each of the multiple tech reps that were used in this study. So we know exactly where the proteiform stops and starts. And uh, we can now quantitatively compare that across different cell lineages. Um, looking, you can do, we have a five color flow sorter. So looking at uh, CD8 versus CD4 T cells, we do find examples of where a proteiform is only present in a given cell type. So here, the, the acetylated form of uh, cyclophilin A, that's PFR number 16924. Uh, it, the only, we only see that in, uh, in CD4, not CD8 T cells, um, the red proteiform over there. So uh, we're accruing all this data in the Allen Proteiform Atlas and uh, across eight uh, B cell subtypes and uh, three T cell uh, pools and subtypes along with a slew of cell lines earlier in the project. And this is from bone marrow and blood. We've got uh, the proteiform record numbers, these PFR numbers. Yeah, that's a new thing. And, and we've gotten Uniprot to cross-reference those in a durable way. So this will be the world's proteiform information for the foreseeable future. And uh, we've accrued 8,400 high-quality proteiforms to date from, pri from primary sources. And uh, we need to get that by next year to 30,000, which was the original goal of the project. And data are immediately available in the public domain. And so finally, you say, well, what's the, not everybody's cup of tea is cataloging proteiforms. I, I, I'm trying to get to catalog a billion of them. Uh, that's going to take a lifetime, perhaps, or I'm hoping much shorter than that. Um, so what's the value of that? Well, we've been trying to do and address the, you know, that as well. And in the context of allograft rejection, so liver and kidney rejection, uh, with the Comprehensive Transplant Center at Northwestern, um, you may know that the infiltration of immune cells into an organ leads to its, uh, after immune activation, leads to its rejection. So we're comparing AR, sorry, AR versus TX, transplant excellence versus acute rejection. There's a third phenotype kind of in the middle of this that you'll see later too, and that, um, that'll come up. It's called ADNR. So we now are doing this on PBMCs. So we, from a patient, uh, I'm showing you 10 patients in each uh, phenotype in a moment. We isolate the, the bulk PBMCs. So this is not cell type resolved. Um, but we're doing our thing here, top-down proteomics. Uh, I don't have time to uh, get into all of it. 
Um, uh, but again, it's the 0 to 30 kilodalton cut, and using a, a whole slew of new technologies that we've got now on greased rails. And uh, looking at 10 transplant excellence, or 10 AR, uh, here's the volcano plot from this now mixed. These are 10 different people, right, in each phenotype. Genetic background's quite diverse. Um, but we still get signal, at least, you know, log two um, uh, type signals, of, uh, fourfold. And, and some of the strongest signals are, are these interesting CXCL4s or platelet factor four. Uh, and let me drill down on the top signal there. Let me go back. The CXCL4 here, that's our, most, that's our strongest signal. Um, and what it is is a new proteiform this time has been mapped. It's this one, 8140 Dalton variant of this platelet factor four. Its proteiform record number is 18631. Um, and it's a proteolytic event right at that phenylalanine there. And obviously, if you trypsinize this, you would, you would destroy that information. We've mapped 13 unique proteiforms. And uh, if you look at the correlation uh, to AR of this, just this proteiform uh, here, the 8140 Dalton variant, uh, or the proteiform of AR and TX, clearly separating with some statistical confidence there. And there's our distraction phenotype, ADNR. And uh, this clearly would be merged had you aggregated all the information from the 13 proteiforms together. You're destroying your statistical power to correlate proteiforms to phenotype. And uh, we have done bottom-up proteomics on this. Uh, re you know, reviewers didn't ask, gratefully. Uh, um, and uh, you know, you just, the statistical power is higher uh, for the proteiform resolved information. And five years ago, I had to frame that as a hypothesis about the technology, that the, that the proteiform information would be more statistically powerful. Now we're in the process of proving it, thanks to support from uh, the ADI program and uh, Paul Allen, Tom, and Kathy. So uh, you know, we're building now uh, from discovery mode. You know the drill. You have to go from discovery to validation to then deployment if you make it through the uh, the chasm of death there for biomarker discovery. And you know, we're developing a panel. We're getting some experience here. Uh, the chemokines, cytokines here, that's the one I focused on with you. Uh, lots of different proteiforms now in a targeted panel. We can now shrink the amount of sample required, right? And, and do this from just a few thousand cells because we're just looking for these 30 proteiforms and we know everything about them. We've mapped them already. And then you could say, well, OK, which, which cell types are there in? These are all in PBMCs. I'm surprised we got signal at all out of this. Now if you go into the right cell subtypes, your signal should go way up, right? And, or you can just look at the proteiforms and refer to the, the Allen Proteiform Atlas, and you'll know which subtypes um, these are in. So uh, that's the, the story. And I'm going to close now uh, with the interaction between the human cell atlas, which is an amazing thing. That, will, that is moving and happening. You can now think about mapping proteiforms in all those cell types. Maybe 4,000 is not the right number. Uh, happy to have a, a vigorous argument about what the, what the number might be, particularly in the brain. Um, but once you know the composition, you then can develop technologies to move in the sweet spot. And that would be affinity reagents that then would allow you to map in space, say for diseased or healthy bone marrow, you could then get back to spatial mapping with proteiform-informed reagents. And that's, that's uh, the story uh, and the, the, the plan for the future. If you do this, you know, I think it would create the definitive parts list of proteins from the human body. And doing it at $1 a proteiform for prote proteomics 2.0, that would be a disruption in the process. And, and I'm just borrowing that from the Genome Project, uh, you know, a dollar a base in 1994 is about when you hit a dollar a base. Twelve years later, amazing disruption in the private sector as well as academics. Um, and so can we domesticate the human proteome in the next 10 or 20 years? I think yes, right? We domesticated plants 10,000 years ago. We domesticated the genome uh, the past couple decades. Can we, in the next few decades, domesticate, get our arms and minds around the human proteome? I think so, at least for the composition. This would provide better biomarkers, stimulate proteiform-informed uh, measurement modalities, enhance drug development, all of the things, regenerative biology, 
that um, you would like to take a whole plateau and ratchet it up from 1.0 to 2.0 and all the attendant benefits of doing so. So with that, I, you know, I think you can see the Allen Foundation is uh, propulsive in this. And uh, you know, if we look back 10 or 20 years ago, and, and there's, there's some elements that have moved on, you can see the early investment here. So thanks for your time, attention, and uh, look forward to questions. Any questions? From a transcriptional standpoint, when you look in some of these specific cell types and have the proteoforms, let's just, you know, without the post-translational modification, just the splice size, how much does that match the, the uh, you know, what might be predicted from uh, splicing in RNA sequencing? Oh, oh, uh, so that's an interesting open question, right? Rolls right off the tongue. But how do I find, especially when there's low sequence reads, I'm asserting a bunch of alternative splice variants. Now I want peptides that map and prove with the exon exon boundary uh, spanning peptides. They are very hard to find. It's sort of an open question about our low abundance transcripts that might be alternatively spliced. Do they actually make it to the protein level? Um, when things are nicely abundant and you see a couple isoforms and high abundance, you can nail those down by either top down or bottom up. I'm, wonder, I'm wondering if you have a plan to integrate your um, proteoforms with the structural information in the protein data bank or something similar, and would uh -huh. that help in some way to diversify further? Yeah, mapping PTMs onto crystal structures or cryo-EM structures, totally exciting thing. It's, it's just when you have a, so many PTMs as, as comes up from bottom up, proteomics, phosphoacetylomics, you know, mapping those on and, and then getting assurance about their stoichiometry, this is what's kind of frustrating that conversation now, but it's a, it's a great question. Neil, very nice talk. I was curious about uh, the idea of making antibodies to the different proteoforms. One of the challenges in that will be to get the antigen itself, the, the individual proteoforms with post-translational modifications. This has been a real problem. And, phosphorylated proteins and other PTMs. Mm. Uh, do you have any ideas about that, how you could purify the actual antigens that you'd need to make the, the antibodies? Yeah, I think in the case of the nitrosylation, you would try to get the small peptide, get the epitope and the monoclonal that would do it, or polyclonal. Maybe we could go backwards in time to go forward. Um, the bispecifics are something that I think about too. Um, or nanobodies, you know, that, there's a lot of already in investment in that area to, to get better in, reagents. In terms of the libraries, yeah, but in terms, the, the key is the antigen, getting the actual post-translationally modified protein. Oh, you want the full length. The pro oh, you're well, talking about proteiform synthesis. Uh, well, and I think you, if you wanted to get antibodies to them, you probably would, you, would need that, right? I mean, you're, you're thinking of just I, getting yeah, the I was peptides thinking themselves. A little, Those are actually quite challenging. Uh, yeah, so proteoform synthesis, as soon as you catalog them and you know that they're important in biology, you would want to synthesize them. Yeah. And there are, for phosphorylations, we're doing this with Mike Jewett, um, you know, you can put in a stop code on and hijack that to put on a phosphoserine mm -hmm. site specifically. Other, other mods will follow. So I think proteoform synthesis will spin up in the next few years. Okay, thank you so much. Thanks.